Hello, welcome to Straight Talk About Carbon, a conversation with Agoro Carbon Alliance exploring more about the carbon market. I'm your host, Megan Grabner, and with us today is Jerry Stevens with Agoro Carbon Alliance. Hello. Hi, Megan. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Before we get into our conversation, uh, let's talk a little bit about your background and what you do with Agoro. Absolutely. I'm a regional sales manager with Agoro, so I'm the I'm the guy that people talk to about signing contracts and kind of the business end of it. Uh, you know, my background is uh, I've been an agronomist for all my career. I started out in kind of the crop protection chemical business for a lot of years with a major manufacturer. It's been about 24 years doing that and about 14 years in retail, actually. Uh, that's where I've been lately. And this carbon markets of, of where I've moved into now, it's a pretty exciting space to be involved with. It really is interesting, and I've loved hosting these conversations because I get to learn, but we get to also provide farmers around the country with information they may not have readily available at their fingertips at all times. Right. Absolutely. A lot of questions out there. (laughs) There are, and we're going to start first and explore some of the misunderstandings or misconceptions maybe that folks have uh, about the carbon market. So as you're talking to them, what are some things that you hear back from them? Probably the biggest misconception is that they don't qualify. And people tend to disqualify themselves uh, way too often. And as we have conversations with them, they may find that part of their operation may actually fit into a carbon program. So that self-disqualification is probably one of the biggest misconceptions. If somebody has a new piece of ground that they picked up, if they're already existing, uh, using existing practices on their, on their existing land, but they're gonna implement new practices on new ground, it's a great place to sign up that eight, those acres in a program. And the second misconception is that just because I don't qualify now, I never will qualify in a carbon program. They're evolving. These are the first rounds of these carbon credits that are out there in programs. So just keep in tune, be engaged. When you have that conversation with farmers, what do you want them to take away from it? When they ask you, okay, if I don't qualify now, what do you mean by I can qualify later? Do they need to keep having conversations? Do they need to check back in, maybe get a little out of their comfort zone? Well, I think part of that is just engaging in the process. And, and the only way to really understand these programs are to engage with, with companies. You know, we have a lot of conversations with people. You know, a good example is I believe in the future there'll be a lot, uh, there'll be a lot of credits or programs available for water quality, for example. So just because you're already a no-till or already doing cover crops, it might be that you can implement practices to, to help water quality and be involved in those type of credits. So I think there's there's quite a few more opportunities coming down the pike. Let's talk a little bit about some of um, the, the maybe more known or some of those practices and how they're used in that carbon credit process. I think specifically like reduced tillage or no-till, uh, cover crops, nitrogen management. How does that all play in that conversation? Well, absolutely. We're going to come back to nitrogen management because that's kind of a greenhouse gas avoidance type of credit. But the real key one that we work on are going to be um, improved tillage and and introducing cover crops into their operations. And it's proven over the last 20 years, people know that no-till increases soil health, organic matter, if you will. Uh, Cover crops having a variety or biodiversity out there increases microbial activity. So between tillage, improved tillage, cover crops, we increase that microbiome, the, the biology in the soil. And with that comes increased organic matter. And while you're doing that, you're also sequestering carbon. And that's what our program really focuses on. So let's let's talk a little bit uh, about the two types of carbon credits. Um, it, in, uh, we'll start there, and, and then we can get into some of that conversation about that. Well, and let's demystify this a little bit. I think that's probably where there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace. If you look at the practices everybody talks about, they talk about uh, tillage, improved tillage. They talk about cover crops and nitrogen management. And in those in these programs, actually, we're creating two different types of credits. One of them is a greenhouse gas avoidance credit, which means if you just till your land less, you have less carbon emissions. If you involve a cover crop, uh, it means that you will have less CO2 emissions. If you stabilize your nitrogen, you'll have less greenhouse gas emissions. And those are kind of annual credits. They're fairly easy. Uh, they're kind of the easy button of carbon credits, if you will, because you can get in the program this year and out next, but there's not much permanency. The confusion is those same three practices, they're being used for carbon sequestration in the soil, which if anybody's trying to increase organic matter, if you will, in the soil, okay, to increase soil organic carbon or capture it takes time. Those tend to be longer term contracts 
there's more permanency and they're actually more desirable for the buyers. So the confusion is we're kind of doing short-term credits and these long-term soil sequestration credits, but the practices are the same. And I think that's what's leading to a lot of confusion in the markets. When we talk about short-term versus long-term, is short-term a way for guys and gals, women, farmers in general, to dip their toe into the carbon markets to see if it works for them? Or is it kind of, um, do you see a little bit of both, whether they'll go for long-term first because it sounds like a plan for them? How does that kind of play out in that conversation? The, the real key is what they call additionality. So in other words, you have to have a new practice or an improved practice to get involved in either one of those programs. Okay. The issue gets to be sometimes is if people decide to kind of go for the short-term programs and try it out, if they implement a cover crop program, okay, in a greenhouse gas avoidance program, which is a year-to-year program, it really, they are not going to be able to get involved in a long-term soil sequestration program because they are already involved in a carbon program. They already implemented it for a different type of carbon program. So this is part of the homework people need to do is they need to ask questions about what type of credits am I creating and which ones they want to be involved in just a year-to-year program, which may work out well if you have leased ground. Long-term programs tend to work better on where you have long-term leases or owned property. Jerry, how does that also impact or uh, play a role in producers' revenue when they're looking at opportunities in carbon markets? Well, I, I think that we, we should have probably talked about this under misconceptions and that uh, these carbon programs are not a cash cow. Uh, in other words, what they're doing is people have known this for years, that these types of conservation practices increase soil health. And really, the real benefit long term is having better quality soil. It's a legacy farmers and ranchers leave to the next generation. So this is some of the first programs outside the government, private programs that will incentivize people to help make those changes. If somebody wants to go to strip till, the amount of money I can pay them in a, in a carbon program is not gonna pay for a quarter million dollar strip till machine. I'll be the first to tell people that. If you are already predisposed to going to strip till, I can help supplement that and pay for part of that conversion. It's very interesting to kind of see it all unfold or open the, open the door behind some of these questions. What are, when we talk about maybe questions that farmers and ranchers have, I know that as I talk to farmers around the country, they sometimes ask, what are we selling? So mm-hmm. when we talk about that, how do you answer that question for farmers? Well, it's a great question because, uh, well, first of all, what we're not buying or they're not selling, they're not selling long-term mineral rights or water rights or anything along that line. If you, if you live uh, in the northern part of the U.S. and the Dakotas, Lots of questions around mineral rights and oil rights, correct? And I'm sure that holds true across the country. Nothing to do with that. So what they're selling, what I'm going to buy from a grower, okay, is a, is a metric ton of carbon in the soil. And a metric ton of carbon is 2,204 pounds, okay? So that, that is a carbon credit. So a ton, a metric ton of carbon is a carbon credit. And the only thing we're buying from them are the carbon credits that we create in our program, okay? So in other words, we take a baseline soil sample, We come out in years five and 10 and take soil samples and we can tell how much carbon they sequestered, how many tons that plants have taken out of the air and with the residue of the plant or going through an animal has increased the soil organic carbon. And we pay them for those tons, that particular set. It's not the end of carbon credits for that operation because in the future, if there's another program that comes out that maybe it has to do with biologicals or other practices, they can create other carbon credits through other programs Okay, and, and that's a different set of carbon credits. So it doesn't stop them from being involved in the future, um, any other programs. Jerry, what's the best way for farmers to decide uh, if a carbon program is worthwhile for their operation or what type of carbon program works for them? Well, I, I'm gonna quote one of our agronomists who says, if you've been on one farm, you've only been on one farm and everybody's is different, right? And just their style, their manpower, their resources. I. I always tell people first and foremost that these carbon programs, whichever one you choose, okay, uh, it it has to fit your operation. Okay, if you're looking for long-term soil health, uh, water infiltration rates, water holding capacity, those sort of things, a soil soil sequestration program for carbon is probably your better choice. But also it means that you don't have, if you don't have a million dollars or half a million dollars to go buy the equipment, does it really fit your operation? So I, th- I think that's the first thing people need to look at. What, 
what practices am I looking to change on my farm? Am I looking to reduce tillage? Okay, then it might be great for a carbon program. Okay, but it doesn't, these programs alone are probably not going to finance all of all of that change. So make sure it fits your operation. And if it feels really forced, take a look down the line of what these next sets of programs will look like. And I think it's worthwhile waiting. Jerry, if folks want to find out more information, uh, what's the best way for them to do so? Well, you know, at Agoral Carbon at our website would be the best place to engage. Um, and if they, if they have questions on it, of course, they can get a hold of any of us that are agronomists or regional sales managers. Uh, but on the website, you can register and one of us will get a hold of you and we can talk about whether this carbon program will fit your operation. Jerry, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to chat today, but also it's so fascinating to see uh, the opportunities that present themselves within these carbon markets and carbon conversations. Megan, appreciate the, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Again, for more information, go to agorocarbonalliance.com. With straight talk about carbon, I'm Megan Grebner for Brownfield.